Turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. By that clock back there, it's 10 minutes after 12, so I've already preached over, so I'm just going to keep on going, all right? No, this is, uh, this is one of those things that God was dealing with me about, and um, you know me, I always overdo the messages, I always put way more verses in there, is my microphone working? All right. I always put way more verses in there than sometimes what I think I need, I just never want to run out of Bible to preach. So we get to a place and I feel like God's telling us enough, then we'll cut it out and maybe we'll pick it up next Sunday. But I want you to ask the question, have you ever been tempted? Okay? In fact, I want, here's what I want you to think about. We're going to read Genesis 3. And uh, who in here has really, really, really good memories of your grandparents or maybe your great-grandparents? They were real old and they were the sweetest people that you knew and they worked with their hands and they were just great people. It, it had people like that, amen? All right, I want you to take those people and picture them right here in Genesis 3. I want you to think of your favorite people, your grandparents, great-grandparents, whatever, that you're seeing them when they're 60, 70, 80, maybe 90 years old, and you're seeing sweet, loving people. But the truth of it is, those people, when it came to temptation, failed miserably. They did things that you will never know they did because they probably did it at a time before even you were born. They were very wicked, evil, hell-deserving sinners that when tempted, they gave in. Now, that's not the picture we like, right? But that's who they were. And you know how I know that? Because you turned out just like them. I turned out just like them. Amen? So we're going to deal with temptation. We try to understand what the Bible says about it. Genesis chapter 3, are you there? You believe the Bible? You believe man came from monkeys? No. Because if man evolved, then this story can't be true. And this story is very true. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. What that means is he's smarter than you are. He's secretive. He knows your weaknesses. And he knows that he can dangle temptation in front of you. And more often than not, you'll fall for it. He knows that because that's what's happened is that you've been tempted and you failed. Okay? That's why we're here in church, right? We're all sinners, so we admit that we're sinners. We admit that we failed at just about everything, every decent thing that God has offered to us, we failed at it. We have given in to temptation and we'll do it yet again. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, as I'm reading this, normally when I deal with Genesis chapter 3, I'm always focused on the serpent, what the serpent did, and how the serpent did this, and how the serpent does this, and this is how he lies to us, and he, he goes against the Bible and all this stuff. I'm not focusing on the serpent today. I'm focusing on the sinner. On me. And you. That's the focus. So forget about... How subtle the serpent is and how, how, how he deceived you. And if it wasn't for him, you probably wouldn't do these things. And we'll show you that from the Bible. So in verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. 
For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof. So far, she's got it in her hand, she has not sinned. She's got it in her hand. God did not say they couldn't touch it. She said that. Now, it could be said that she now has violated her own rules. Because maybe in her mind, she established a rule in her mind that the best way to not eat it is to not touch it. That makes sense. Right? If I, if there are no Oreo cookies in the house, I will not eat Oreo cookies. See how simple that is? I can't eat Oreo cookies. Why? There are none. So if you don't have them in your house, you won't eat them. If there's no alcohol in your house, you won't drink it. If there's no marijuana or dope or Anything like that, if there's none of that in your house, you won't do it, right? It's that simple. If you don't bring in a string of half-naked women in your house, then you won't be tempted by them. That sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Not so much anymore. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves Aprons. What were they doing? Covering, them all, covering their own nudity up. Covering their own shame. Which is what we do. Right? You eat the Oreos. You got to get rid of the evidence. Right? Make sure there's no crumbs. Make sure, and when you eat Oreos, it's, you're talking at least five, ten minutes to get that out of your mouth. Right? Okay? That's what they did. They were trying to cover up for their own disobedience to God. And God, let's just say that God sees right through the aprons. Amen? God sees right through the fig leaves. You're not fooling Him. You might be able to fool everybody else for a while. You're not fooling God. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You ask God to help me preach this, okay? Father, help me preach this. Help me, Lord, to deliver it in such a way that it it'll cause us to think. Lord, there's probably parts of this, Lord, that may end up getting preached that make some people uncomfortable. But, Lord, that's okay as long as you're in it. We need to be reminded, Father, of just how easy it is to tempt us. We, we don't make it hard for the devil to do this. So, Father, every temptation that we've ever fallen after, we're guilty of it. No lying to you about it. No trying to hide it. We're guilty of it. And, Father, you know us. We cannot, our conscience will not allow us to make a promise to you that we can't keep. Because we know how weak we really are. Father, help me to preach this. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how, Lord, to reach people. But, Father, deal with me. Deal with me first. Deal with my wife. Deal with my daughters and sons and all their family. 
Deal with the people in this church, God. That they're do, they, God, they do things I have no idea that they do. Don't want to know. These people online, God, between us, were guilty of committing just about every sin that you told us not to commit. And Father, we are ashamed of that. We would not want you to expose us in front of everybody, Lord. We would not want you to do that. Because we're just too ashamed of things we've done. Father, have mercy on us. And teach us, Father, about how the devil works. And about ourselves, Lord. Show us some good things from your word, God. And help me to preach it and teach it. I pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Let me just ask you a question, okay? Just, just think now that you're Eve. And up until this time, I mean, you've looked, you've, this is not the first time you've noticed that tree. You've looked at it before. And maybe, maybe you looked at it and said, well, that'd be nice. That'd be good to have. Well, I wouldn't mind having that. I wouldn't mind doing that. And then the tempter comes along and that just pretty much cinches it right there. I mean, once you've got it in your hand, I want you to ask yourself the question, once I have this in my hand, how, how easy is it going to be for me to put it down and walk away? Once I've got it right here. How easy is that once we have sin right in our hands to just set it down and walk away from it? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could. In fact, I know I can't. Being that close, you just, it's just not good. Amen? I mean, there's a reason why God tells us in His Word that when it comes to sin and temptation, that we're to avoid even the appearance of evil. I mean, right? I mean, let, let's just say that Let's say that it's, it's wrong to drink Budweiser. Now that doesn't mean it's right to drink Michelob, amen? It's wrong, let's say it's wrong to drink Budweiser. So, if someone gives me for Christmas a Budweiser t-shirt or a Budweiser hat, I like to wear hats, okay? If somebody gives me a Budweiser hat, should I wear it? Why? It's not, the Bible didn't say it's wrong to wear a hat. The Bible says it's wrong to drink that rot gut. Amen? It's wine and strong drink. Is a, they're a mocker and they're deceive you. So it, it wouldn't be right for me to go around wearing a Budweiser hat, trying to advertise for a Budweiser, making, my, making it look like that that's what I do. It wouldn't be right for me to do that, would it? That's, that's avoiding the appearance of evil. And while some say, well, what I'm doing is not wrong. I mean, according to the Bible, it's not wrong. But you've got to admit, some things just don't look right. They don't look good on you. You probably should not have been near that tree, at least within arm's length of it. You probably should have never picked that fruit because once you got that far, there's probably no turn back. I mean, it'd be a miracle of God that he came on you so strong that you said, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. But it wouldn't be because you're that strong, would it? Uh, turn your Bible to 1 John, chapter 2. And I, I've... I've talked about this before, about the numbers here in Genesis 3, where if you go back, it says that she saw the tree was good for food, was pleasant to the eyes, and desired to make one wise. So three things that was going through her mind at the time. And then John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2 tells us what that was. So John says, verse 15, love not the world. That means... That fruit on that tree, hate it. Hate it. 
When you start hating it, you're, you're less likely to be part of it. Amen? I mean, if you hate... Um, how can I say this? I better just stick with the Bible. If you hate it, you just won't have anything to do with it. It'll be a whole lot easier for that. But let me tell you something about hating sin. We're not born hating sin. We're born embracing it. We're born with it in us. And at, at a very young age, you become a sinner. Even before you have the knowledge of it, you are born a sinner. Before you have the knowledge of good and evil, you still like to do things that are wrong. You'll lie to your mom and dad. You'll try not to get caught at stuff. I mean, when I go in my office and I see that desk drawer open, I know one of you bums has been in there getting candy out of my desk. Right? Conniving little. I love you. But our problem is we love the sins that we commit or we wouldn't commit them. We love them. And the only way that I've found to start hating our sin is when we start having to deal with the consequences of it. Am I right? When you start seeing what your sin is doing to you, what it's doing to your family, what it's doing to your country. What is sin doing to this country, Wayne? For some reason now, everybody that's got a public name, for some reason, stuff they did 20, 30, 40 years ago is just coming out, isn't it? You see, if we would have known when we were 20 that that stuff would come back and bite us on the backside when we're 60, we probably still would have done it because we're 20, right? You see, you start dealing with the consequences of things that you did because sometimes God won't take those away from you. And He's going to use them as a rod to correct you. And when you get hit with that rod enough, all of a sudden now, you don't like the things that you used to like. You find it a little bit easier to love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So as you grow and mature in Christ, what God does is that he uses the repercussions and the consequences of your past sins to get you to hate them so you don't do them no more. Right? I mean, I, my, uh, my Uncle Jay was a truck driver. Okay? Truck drivers do three things really well. They drive a truck, they drink a lot of coffee, and they smoke a lot of cigarettes. And he sucked them down one after another. And he got to where he was getting him. So this back in the 80s, he checked himself into a clinic that was going to cure him of smoking cigarettes. So you know what they did? Got a great big one of them big metal bowls, you know, full of ashes, cigarette butts that they had wet down. Stuck his head over it, had 10 Lucky Strike unfiltered cigarettes, and they said, suck them down as fast as you can, one after another. And he did. And he said his shoes came flying out of his mouth. He hurled so bad. It made him so sick. What they were doing, they were trying to rewire his brain. It worked. Because after that, the cigarettes didn't taste good anymore. His mind associated them cigarettes with what happened to him, and that was a help to him. And that's what God has to do with you. I'm telling you young people, you're going to have to deal with it. Because when you get 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, you're going to wish to God that you had never done those things. Youth is wasted on the young, isn't it? 
For all that is in the world, here it is, this is what Eve saw, the lust of the flesh. That, if you go back to Genesis 3, uh, she saw the tree was good for food. You know what that, that means? Boy, that would be good in my tummy. And then the uh, lust of the eyes, because she looked and she said it was pleasant to the eyes. Okay? Fruit is pleasant to the eyes. If fruit has like all these little thorns and spikes and nasty stuff oozing out of it, we would go, I ain't eating that. Ugh! Boy, don't you wish all sin was that way, right? But it's not. Who made this tree? Who made this tree? Who put it where he put it? Because you're going to have to make a choice in this world. You're going to love God, you're going to love your sin. Because it's not going anywhere. Sin doesn't go away. Amen? You live to be 80, 90 years old, sin doesn't just go away. It's still there. The older we get, we just can't keep up. We can't cut the mustard anymore, can we? Okay? And then it was the lust of the eyes, and then it was the pride of life. Boy, if I had that, and if it made me wise, why? I could win all the arguments with my husband. Right? So whether it's lust of the flesh, or lust of the eyes, or pride, you're going to fail. There's no way around it. You know what I figured out while, a long time ago? I'd rather, I'd rather be guilty of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes than I would be pride. Because proud people cannot be talked to. I don't do anything wrong. I'm fine the way I am. See, that's pride. Pride goes before destruction and, and a fall, a haughty spirit goes before a fall. And that Bible's right. But those of you who deal with the lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes, at least God can deal with you about your sin. But pride's hard to get through. Because what happens is, the people who don't deal with lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes, either that's just not their nature or they've just advanced in years and it's just not a big deal to them anymore, I guarantee you they deal with pride. Because you know what happens? Well, about half the people in my church, they're all on the near internet all the time, or they're all looking at this, or all they're lusting over that. I don't do that stuff. And then we start acting like we're better than everybody else. That's pride. Amen? Now, turn to Matthew 4. Matthew 4, verse 1. Take your time because I'm seeking the Lord on where he wants me to go with this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now I'm going to stop right here and I want you to think about this for a minute. Here we have, we have, we have comparisons here. We have Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Then we have Christ in Matthew 4. Okay? Adam and Eve, were they hungry? They had that whole garden, didn't they? Were they thirsty? No, oh, they had four rivers, rivers coming out of the Garden of Eden. They could have drank from either one of them. They had, they had it made. They had food. They had water. That the, Apparently, the temperature was just perfect for them to walk around naked, not... Not be cold, not get too hot. They, everything was just fine for them. I mean, think about it. They had everything except that fruit. Uh, Jeff Bezos, you know who that is? He owns Amazon.com. He's now worth $100 billion. Ron, I can't, I can't fathom having... a. a uh, let me see. Let me pull out a, about a billion dollars here for you, okay? 
He could hand out a billion dollars and still have 99 billion dollars. He could lose his wallet and it wouldn't matter to him, right? You know what a guy with a hundred billion dollars doesn't have? Another hundred billion dollars. You think Jeff Bezos is going to say, you know what, I think I can retire now. He's not. He's, they're talking about building one of those plants out here in St. Louis. He's, he's going to keep going until... What, what do you do when you have everything? You die a lonely, miserable man like Solomon did because there's nothing else to have and you, all, and you still want. Sam Walton died unhappy because he wanted to start another Walmart store. Jeff Bezos has $100 billion and he's upset now that he's going to lose a billion dollars and he wants $200 billion. These people don't stop. You see what I'm saying? Just because you sinned and got fulfilled doesn't mean you're going to stop then. You're going to keep going. Adam and Eve had everything except that one fruit. Now compare that to Jesus right here. Look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus has been 40... Here, here watch this. Here, Adam and Eve is in the garden. Jesus is in the wilderness. He has nothing... He's gone 40 days without eating. And Adam and Eve just ate. And they want another fruit. Jesus has had nothing for 40 days. So watch this. Verse 3, And the tempter came to him, and, and he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And what's wrong with eating bread? Nothing. Not a thing wrong with eating bread. But look at verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him to a holy city and setteth him in a, on a pinnacle of the temple. And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God. It says the second time he said that, didn't, isn't it? If thou be the Son of God. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against stone. See, the devil's even quoting scripture here. Jesus said unto him, and if you go read Psalm 91, you'll find there was a part that Satan conveniently left out, and that was the part about trampling the dragon underfoot. Okay? So anyway, verse 7, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh them into an exceeding high mountain and showed them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. In verse 10, Jesus, Then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Adam and Eve's in the garden, and they have everything. They just ate, and yet the devil's going to tempt Eve with one more piece of fruit. And she fell for it. It was like, it didn't take anything. It's not like the devil worked on her for days and days and days and, and, and broke her down. All he did was said two or three sentences to her and left, and she went right for it. That's us. We could have everything and want more. We could sin here, sin, sin this, sin doing this, and sin doing that, sin saying this, and sin being a part of this. We can do that, and the devil comes out with one more sin, and we'll go, sure, why not? That's us. Here's the Savior. He's in the wilderness. He hasn't eaten for 40 days. So, did Jesus get tempted the way we get tempted? If you look at it, first thing, tempter came to him and said, um, command that these stones be turned to bread. Okay? That is lust of the flesh. And then he said, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Um, that is the pride of life. And then down here at the bottom, see all these kingdoms? It's the lust of the eyes. Jesus was tempted being far weaker than you. And he never sinned. Now, I've preached this before about how when we're being tempted, do what Jesus did. 
pull out your old King James Bible and let him have it. Amen? Now, that's a good thing to do. Don't get me wrong. But the biggest point being made here is not the... Here, this is the antidote now for every time you're in temptation. Every time you're in temptation now, just start reading Bible verses to the devil and you won't sin ever again. I mean, I'm not saying it's not a good idea. It is. But the point here is that we failed. He never does. And here's what I'm saying. Our salvation is not based upon, from this day forward, how we put away temptation from us and how we achieve righteousness. Our salvation is never going to be about our righteousness. Never. It'll bring us righteousness. But it's not going to be a contest of who's better than who. Amen? We will still fail. He won't. Let me, uh, give me a minute. Let me find a verse here that's in my, in my mind. Um, that's not it. That's, that, yeah, let's do this one. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Okay? So, Roy, I'm going to talk about you. I think Roy's watching. Okay? Roy lets me talk about him. Okay? So let's say Roy, Roy's a fine, upstanding member of our church. We love him and Bonnie. They're great people. They come help us out every month, get our packets out, and, and wonderful people. Somebody will show up one day that'll say, well, I knew Roy back years ago, and I hate to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Roy used to drink alcohol. Yeah, we know that. We know that. Oh, but he used to get really bad drunk. Yeah, we, we know that. Uh, him, him and body almost split up over it. Yeah, we know that. So that's not going to hurt us, is it, with Roy? We know the guy. We know he's a filthy, rotten, drunk sinner that God saved him. And he'll tell you, it's been 20-some-odd years at 4 o'clock this afternoon and 12 days and 18 seconds that I've been dry. See, that, he takes a lot of pride in that, and that's good. You know what I'm saying to you? Okay? Roy has told me a hundred times that he told me once, Brother Mike, if anybody here needs help with, you know, being a drunk or drugs or whatever, I don't mind helping because I've been there. You see, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, which one of us men can be overtaken in a fault. Raise your hand, guys. Bunch of reprobate heathen. So let's say John is overtaken in a fault. Which one of us guys are going to come to him and say, John, we're here for you, buddy. Let's say Ryan. Ryan's going to be overtaken in a fault. Which one of us are going to come and say, Ryan, I love you, man. I've been there. I've done stupid stuff. Okay, I'm with you, buddy, 100%. Ryan, who are you going to be there for? Who are you going to be here? Who are you going to be here for? Anybody in this church? No matter what they do. No matter what they do. We are going to restore. We don't bayonet our wounded out on the field of battle. We take them to the hospital so they can get back on their feet. That's that's biblical. Because who we won't help, who are sinners, they may just not be able to come to your rescue either. First Timothy, well, in fact, that's not, uh, there's another verse here. Um, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Is that it, Lord? Is that the one? Maybe that's it. Yeah, okay, I'm getting there. Hebrews chapter 2. 
I got three more verses. I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. I mean, God lived flesh and blood life like you and I. Okay? Did God ever get tired? Yep. God ever have backaches? Especially that one day. Okay? Did God ever mourn the loss of family members? Yeah. Verse... Uh, uh, so he himself took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's us. We were subject to bondage, Scotty, and we were scared to death we were going to die before we were forgiven. Right? So, verse 16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels... But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Have you ever looked at the family members in Abraham's family? They're murderers. They're drunkards. They've got incest in their family. They're adulterers and fornicators and whoremongers and every other kind of lie, cheat, and thief that you can think of. That's what Jesus inherited in his genes. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Because you know what Jesus knows? Jesus knows that he passed the temptation test and you didn't. And you won't again. And he will come to you every single time and say, I know what it's like. I love you. Let me walk you through this. Let me help you through this because I know how tough this is. Listen, Jesus was starving to death and the fact of having home-baked butter bread right there in front of him, I, there's no way in the world I'd have turned that down. Amen? And then Hebrews 4, turn there. Verse 14. Seeing then, seeing then that we have a high, great high priest, great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the Son of God. I like that because the devil is going, Are you, if you're really the Son of God, then do this. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Isn't that what we found out? He was tempted with lust of the flesh, he was tempted with lust of the eyes, and he was tempted with pride of the life. In all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain what? Mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Bible is establishing a foregone conclusion. Christ endured the temptation and succeeded and you didn't. And the conclusion is that since you didn't, you can still go boldly before the throne of grace and find mercy. Still. You still can. Yeah, but, Brother Mike, I said that I would never do this again, and there am I doing it again. Surely, there must be something in the Bible that I don't get forgiven after so many times. Is there? Not that I'm aware of. Now, you may still have to deal with the consequences like God said. But I would rather deal with the consequences here and go to heaven than any other, any other alternative. Last verse, James chapter 2, or James chapter 1. Here it is right here. Mm, 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 mm. Boy, there's a lot still to preach here. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, my brethren, I want you to look at the exact wording of your Bible. Count it all joy when ye fall. Fall into divers, which means various temptations. So let me just ask. Who in here, just this last week,
fell into diverse temptations. The rest of you better raise your hand. Your lying bunch. Sure you did. Sure you did. Your flesh is so unruly. And it's going to take a while. But at some point, God will cause in your mind to say, it ain't worth it anymore. It ain't worth it anymore. At some point, you grow up. Amen? Amen. Knowing this, no, 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 what, look, at, look at the Bible now. Look at your Bible. Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your righteousness worketh patience. Is that what it says? Trying of your what? You know what he's talking about? Do you still believe that you can go boldly to the throne of grace? Do you still believe that? Bradley Crum first came to me, really, for salvation. He came early on a Sunday morning, and he was talking to me back there, and he, he bombshelled me. He said, you know, at the Mormon church, I have to confess all my sins to the bishop. And I went, what? Said, yeah, I, I thought everybody knew that. You've got to go to the bishop and confess all your sins. And the Holy Ghost was just going, ask him this, Mike, ask him this. Uh, Bradley, I guarantee you, you didn't tell him everything, did you? And he went, no. I said, why not? I was scared too. Bradley didn't want that bishop to know that he's a reprobate sinner, dirty, nasty, evil thing. Because that's, in the Mormon church, it's all about how good you look on the outside. Am I right? Sure it is. And I would say in a lot of other churches too. And I said to him, Bradley, you know that you can tell God everything, don't you? Yeah. Why don't you tell God everything today? Okay. He's now working down here at Gospel Life Free Will Baptist Church. He's Larry Allison's assistant. I mean, he is on fire for the Lord. That's what God does. That's what God does with sinners who are too afraid to go to the bishop. But they're not afraid to go to God. So knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Do you still believe that God forgives sin? Do you still believe that God lifts people up that are fallen? If you believe that about you, let's start believing it about one another. I've come to the conclusion of my sermon. I've come to the conclusion that it is not going to shock me if somebody out of this church comes to me and confesses who knows what. I've decided that it's not gonna, I'm not gonna go, <gasps> get out! I've decided I'm not gonna do that. I've decided that if God laid it on your heart enough to where you want forgiveness, then you want forgiveness and you should get it. Amen? So, God's going to send sinners into this church. Bring them. God's going to send people into this church that's got some of the goofiest, stupid stuff in them that anybody's ever heard of. Join the crowd. Okay? Again, if you think I'm telling you, oh, don't worry about temptation, just fall for it. God will take If you think I'm telling you that, you're crazy. What I'm telling you is that tr God is trying your faith, not your righteousness. He already knows. You've already shown God you don't have any righteousness. Show God your faith. You still believe. Stand to your feet. If you are here, here's how I'm going to do this. If you are here, 
and there is someone in your life that you have not forgiven. I'm not going to demand that you forgive them. What I'm going to tell you is, if you don't let God do it in you, you won't do it. So with everything that we've seen in mind, we failed, Christ didn't. Would you be willing, if God put a sweet spirit in you, would you be willing to forgive others for what you yourself need to be forgiven of? So I'm going to ask you, you can either stay right where you are, or maybe you could encourage someone by you coming down to one of these benches, and that says to somebody else, well, if they go, then I'll go. So, who'll break the ice here? <laughs> Gwenny, you come down here and pray, okay? Come down here and pray with Mommy, all right? You mean my children are praying? Oh my goodness. What have they done? I love this church. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you, God. First things first, we are confessing our own sins. We are telling you, God, that which you already know so well. We cannot hide our transgressions from you. We cannot cover them up sufficiently. You will not accept it. You see, Lord, the darkness as you see light, and there is nothing hid from you. Father, we come before you today. We ask and we beg, Lord, for your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness. Because we tried to do good. We really did. But we failed. And Lord, maybe, maybe ten temptations came and nine of them, we turned it down. The tenth one, it was in our hand. We just couldn't turn it down. But Father, we're asking for your forgiveness and your mercy. And then, Father, we're asking that you put it in our heart to forgive others. Maybe a, maybe a husband needs to forgive a wife or a wife needs to forgive a husband or maybe a, a parent needs to forgive their children or children need to forgive their parent or brothers need to forgive their sisters and so on. Maybe it's friends, maybe it's co-workers, maybe it's church people. But God, we were harboring vengeance on them, and yet we ourselves were the recipient of mercy and not justice. So Father, help us, dear God, to come to grips with our own sinfulness. So that, Father, when we see someone else hurting, struggling, not doing well, we can go to them and restore them and say to them, I know what you're going through. We can have mercy on people, Lord. We can forgive them the way you forgive us. But, Lord, it has to come from you because we don't have it in us. And God, I know that just because I preach something to somebody, that doesn't mean they're changed instantly. Father, you have to change them and have to want it. So Father, we pray, God, that you would forgive the lust of our flesh. That you would forgive the lust of our eyes. It's ever-present. And that you would forgive us of our pride in trying to think that we're better than our neighbor. 
And Father, we want to endure temptation. We want to succeed. So Father, in time, strengthen us. In time, Lord, teach us to hate our sin instead of seeking after it all the time. Teach us that, Father, as you long suffer with us and as you have patience with us. Fill our minds and our hearts with, we don't love this world anymore, we love you. Father, I thank you for this church. I love this church. Thank you, Lord, for what you're able to do here through us and through these people. We thank you, Lord, for uniting us all together. We love you and we love one another. And we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen.